Hi everyone, my name's Yvonne. Uh, we've got our Bible reading now. Uh, we're continuing in 1 Peter. The reading is 1 Peter 2, verses 11 to 25. 1 Peter 2, starting at verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, do not use, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honour the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins. In his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Thanks, Yvonne. Chapel Lane, good evening. My name's Tim, great to be with you. A uh, number of new people in the room and a big welcome to you. Uh, it's great that you've chosen to spend your Sunday night with us, as James mentioned before. Uh, we do have dinner on the deck afterwards. Well, dinner on the deck, it'll be dinner inside because it's a little bit chilly out there. So do stick around for that. Uh, it means we've got a slightly shorter service. There'll be no questions and comments tonight. And uh, you may have noticed that we haven't had the hub out there as well, which for you watching online means there's no hub at home. But we're jumping into the Word and that is a good thing. Uh, so make sure you um, yeah, stick around for dinner if you're in the building, if you're watching online. Drive on down, still, you're still probably close enough. Um, friends, it'd be great to have the word out so that you are seeing that and reading that along with me as we go. Um, if you don't have a Bible with you, stick your hand up and James is at the back will bring a Bible to you. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. Come find me or someone else at the back and we will, we'd be delighted to give you a Bible that you can take home. As we open up the word, why don't we pray to our great God. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who speaks you haven't left us by ourselves to work out who you are or what you've done for us in Jesus, but you have given us your word. And so, Father, we pray that as we open up the scriptures tonight, that you would speak. Show us Jesus so clearly that we are unable to walk out of this room unchanged. And we pray that in his name. Amen. Well, we are going to go on a little bit of a journey Tonight, And in order to go on that journey, I need you to imagine that you are stepping onto a plane and you're stepping onto this plane to go on a flight. But the catch is that you're in a foreign country. You're in a foreign country and a culture which doesn't quite celebrate the same things that you celebrate, doesn't have the same values that you have and has just a different approach to life. And you know that when you're in this country and you're in this culture, you're gonna be given a bit of a hard time and you're sort of expecting that on this plane, you're gonna have a bit of opposition. And so you've got your carry-on baggage and you, you step onto the plane and it all kicks off when you go to put your baggage on uh, in the overhead locker uh, above you. 
you see someone comes up and they shove you in the side because they wanna put their luggage there. And so you're like sort of just getting to terms with all of this. And so you turn to put it uh, in an overhead locker on the other side of the aisle. And then one of the members of the cabin crew comes and taps you on the shoulder and with a smirk on her face says, you are not allowed to put your luggage there. It must go under the seat in front of you. So your blood's boiling a little bit at this point, but you decide path of least resistance we will comply and not make a big scene. And so you put your luggage under the seat in front of you. And as you do that, three pamphlets fall out. Three pamphlets that you have picked up as you walked through the airport terminal and three pamphlets that, uh, as it happens, are gonna be helpful for us as we walk through 1 Peter. We are continuing our series in 1 Peter tonight. It is called Exile. It is helping us to live as citizens of heaven in a world that doesn't always make it easy to live as citizens of heaven. So that's why it's called Exile. Pamphlet one for us tonight is called An Exile's Guide to Self-Care. And my hope is that as we open up the Scriptures tonight, you'll be able to see that there are things in 1 Peter chapter 2 that will help you to care for yourself in a richly biblical Way. Pamphlet number two is called An Exile's Guide to Suffering. And I hope you have your Bibles open because I want you to see that what we look at tonight, which are some confronting things come from God's Word and not from me. And then we're going to bring it home on our journey with the definitive guide for exiles. So An Exile's Guide to Self-Care is pamphlet one. That's where we're going to kick things off. Off. We start in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Bible's open. Here we go. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Now, when we read about the soul, it, we're not talking about a ghost-like substance inside of you that's going to escape to heaven one day. No, when we talk about the soul, we're talking about our Self. It's quite a holistic view of who we are. If you're interested, the word behind it is suke, which is where we get psychology from. And so it's this idea of looking after ourselves, hence self care. So, what does 1 Peter 2 11 have to teach us when it comes to self care? Well, it says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul, which wage war against your self. You see, we are exiles in a world where we are told that the desires we have are the best indication for who our authentic self is. And that if you pursue the desires that you have, then that is your best guide to living an authentic life. And so the world says desires should be pursued. World religions say that generally desires are wrong. The whole premise of Buddhism is, is that if you desire less, then you will be happy. And so man-made religions are often a form of asceticism. That is, it is a good thing in and of itself to deprive yourself. And in fact, the more you deprive yourself, the better your chances are of reaching enlightenment or of living the good life or of appeasing your God or whatever it might be. The world says desires should be pursued. Religion often says that desires should be repressed. But the Bible says that as you come to Jesus, He will reorder your desires. In chapter 1, verse 22 of 1 Peter, we are commanded to love one another deeply from the heart. That is a desire. It is a desire of a rightly ordered heart that we might love one another genuinely. And so the gospel of the Lord Jesus says that desires should be discerned. Are these desires that I have heavenly of the Holy Spirit good or are they of the earth? Are they sinful desires which wage war against my soul. We need to discern whether our desires are good or they are not. And this is the self-care advice that the Bible gives you as an exile. You are a soldier. It is not peacetime in this land where you are living. 
The battlefront is not primarily out there in the culture. The battlefront is primarily in here in yourself where sinful desires wage war against your soul. And so you've got to discern which are good and which are bad. One of the bloodiest battles that has taken place in wartime history was the Battle of Stalingrad in World War II between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. An estimated two two million people died. And one of the best known contests that took place within that five month battle was in a building called Pavlov's house. And Pavlov's house was in an open square, this big open expanse, and it sort of extended into the middle of the square, which meant it was vulnerable to attack on three sides, on the left and on the right and at the front. Pavlov's house was there to be battered by Nazi tanks and foot soldiers. And so every day there were multiple attacks by the Nazi army to try and take control of this building. It was relentless. And through the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit is saying to you tonight, your soul is Pavlov's house. It is vulnerable to attack. It is not peacetime. And so I've made this into a format which might assist the younger members of our congregation. There is your soul, the part of the building that's still primarily intact. And then there is your soul after sinful desires, right? It's not peacetime. We are under attack. And we are under attack attack from our sinful desires which wage war against us. And by the way, if it doesn't feel like your soul is under attack, from sinful desires, then either the Bible is wrong or perhaps there are sinful desires that have taken up residence in the house to such an extent that you don't even notice anymore. And the Exile's Guide to Self-Care says you're in a war against them. And I wonder as you think about your soul, what specific sinful desires are there that wage war against it? Or... What desires have you stopped fighting against? The way you fight against them is by doing good no matter what the circumstances. And that's what pamphlet two, an exile's guide to suffering is all about. In 1 Peter from chapter two, verse 13 to chapter three, verse seven, it all comes under the heading of verses 11 and 12. And so we've looked at verse 11 to fight against sinful desires. And then let's have a look at verse 12. It says, live such good lives among the pagans, that is those living in the world around you when you are in exile, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. And then one of the examples of those human authorities comes in verse 18. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. Now the pamphlet at this point has got six comments that I want to make before we unpack that a little bit more. So bear with me for these six. Six comments. One, this is written to a church in the first century that is in the midst of severe persecution. It was written to people who had minimal minimal rights, opportunities or protections afforded to them. Very different to 21st century Australia. We can be very thankful for that, but it means that we need to have great care as we seek to apply 1 Peter 2 to today's world. Number two, this is written into a context where slaves existed as a part of many households. Some of them were treated well, but many were not. In fact, slaves weren't really considered as people. They didn't have rights. They were the property of their masters. And so the fact that 1 Peter 2 addresses them shows the dignity that the Bible 
affords to all people who are made in God's image. Number three, whatever verse 13 and this command to submit does mean, and we will get to that in a moment, it can't mean do whatever you're told without complaining. And the reason why I say that is because we are commanded to submit for the Lord's sake, which means that there is always a higher authority over your life than whatever human authority is currently in view. Four, there is no command for masters to demand their slaves submit to them. The commands are to those who are under authority and that isn't insignificant. Five, when verse 19 talks about bearing up under suffering, it's primarily talking about not sinning in difficult circumstances. And so in our context where we have more rights and opportunities than what those in the first century did, that might look like using the options you have in our society to get out of the position that you're in. So let me say there is nothing in 1 Peter that ought to prevent you from trying to get out of an abusive situation. If you're in a workplace where there is bullying and harassment, it may well be a wise thing to get out of that situation and get a new job if you can. What our pamphlet is concerned with is how we respond in the moment during difficult circumstances. Uh, A comment at this point, for those who've been following along with the boarding pass, if you came at the beginning of the series, you would have got one of these and there's a QR code that's taking taking you to a webpage where there's a conversation from our church family as we go through 1 Peter. If you'd like one of these, they're on the resource rack at the back and you you can look at that. There was a comment from Amber through the week, which was really, really helpful on this point. So Amber said, the endure in verses 18 to 21 must be calling servants to endure the temptation to sin rather than stay in unjust suffering if you have the option to leave. And that's exactly right. That's really helpful. Six, final comment before we keep going. Your biggest enemy, according to 1 Peter 2, is not your boss. It is your sinful desires. And that is an important perspective to hold on to as we walk through, it, uh, through this whole section. Okay, those things being said, verse 13, this command to submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. I think the best way to wrap our heads around this is to consider it to mean something like willingly place yourself under those who were in authority over you. So if you were a slave in the first century, willingly place yourself under your master. If you are a citizen, willingly place yourself under your government. If you're an employee in 21st century Sydney, willingly place yourself under your boss. If you are a student, willingly place yourself under your teacher. If you're a child or if you're a teenager, willingly place yourself under your parents. Right, there are a whole bunch of authority structures that exist in our society and that's a good thing for our society to be well ordered. And Peter is saying that our job is not to try and usurp and sort of take over those, but to recognise that we have a role in them. And that is a good thing. And so this section is perhaps best translated into our context by considering the workplace scenario that is difficult. Perhaps you've experienced bullying or harassment in the workplace. It's a common thing for those who first step into the workplace environment in casual part-time jobs to be mistreated. Maybe you have a boss who makes unfair demands on your time. Or you have a boss who does nothing and you end up doing all the work for them and making them look good but you get no credit. Maybe you have a boss who underpays you or doesn't follow all the legalities of workplace legislation. There might be a board of some sort who are over the top of you and they make your life difficult. They thwart every effort that you make to do what you think needs to be done. Workplaces can be difficult. And if you haven't experienced those things, then I'm sure you can imagine the kind of sinful desires that wage war against your soul that may pop up in those situations. Envy, jealousy, resentment, bitterness. 
And all the things wage war against us because they lead us away from doing good. They entice you to break out, feel all self-justified in your sin. It's easily done. Your boss gives you a hard time and you know that you're about to head to the lunchroom with your colleagues where you together can just complain and enjoy sharing and venting your frustrations about your boss, subverting his or her leadership. Or maybe it's when you walk through the car park and you walk past your boss's car, which is brand new and very expensive, and you dwell on the envy knowing that they don't deserve it, knowing that it's in part your hours of work that have allowed them to enjoy this luxury that they don't deserve. But it's just envy that's going on inside of you. The pamphlet says, do good. Be a model employee. So if you have complaints or when you have complaints, raise them with your boss directly or follow the right channels, whatever they may be in your situation. Pray for your boss, whether they deserve it or not. Talk with your community group about how you can honour Christ in your difficult situation at work. It is not easy to work out how to be a Christian in the workplace and so we need each other. My wife, um, Lauren, and I have recently been digging, digging into some personality profiling. Think Myers-Briggs, DISC profile, that kind of stuff. And the one that we've been thinking about is called uh, Ocean. And so here is my Ocean profile. I won't um, bore you with the details of what those different things stand for, but here is Lauren's Ocean profile. <laughs> they say opposites attract. The fifth column in the profile is all about uh, how you're likely to react to negative things that pop up in life and how much you hold on to those or are affected by those negative things. And so for me, almost nothing. For Lauren, it's hard to be more. So I'm the sunshine kid, right? I'm the eternal optimist. She'll be right is the mantra of my life. You stab me in the leg, I see it as a growth opportunity, right? That's who I am. But my personality has its drawbacks because I don't have a great attention to detail sometimes because it'll all come out in the wash. I'm unlikely to hold people to things because, ah, it doesn't matter too much, right? Put simply, it's really hard for me to suffer, which makes me insufferable to people like Lauren <laughs> for whom the hard things of life can be felt quite acutely. So pray for our marriage. <laughs> but the reason why I share this is that some of you might be sitting there thinking, is it just that Peter is an optimist that enables him to write about suffering so positively? Like, is this just a personality quirk of Peter and it's going to be different for different people? And the answer to that is no. Look at verse 21. To this, to this way of life you have been called about having Christian integrity in a difficult workplace situation. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And when you bear with unjust suffering in the workplace or in relationships or wherever else, and mindful that God is the one who judges you, you decide to do good instead of give in to your sinful desires, you know a little bit more what it is to be like Christ. And Peter isn't an optimist. It's just that as an exile... He would rather know Christ better than avoid suffering. So pamphlet one said, you've got to know yourself as an exile. You're a soldier. Pamphlet two says, you've got to prepare for suffering as an exile. Walk like Christ. 
Which brings us to pamphlet three, the definitive guide for exiles. And as you're on your flight and you've read pamphlet one and two, you feel like there's a very obvious question which pamphlet three needs to answer. And that is, how do I do this? How do I fight against my sin like a soldier and not give in to those sinful desires? How do I bear up in the midst of suffering and not be overcome by envy or bitterness or rage or whatever else it might be? And this is the great weakness of self-help stuff, by the way. It's quite easy to tell someone what they should do or to be told what you should do. Most people know what they should do. It's doing it that's the hard bit. If you need proof of this, just look at the size of the confectionery aisle in the supermarket. Right? We know that we don't need that. We know that we shouldn't eat that stuff. And yet our behaviour shows that our knowledge doesn't match our practice. We all know we should eat healthily, exercise regularly, get enough sleep, be kind to those around us, respond with love, not hate. The problem isn't knowing what to do. It's how do I do it? So how do we do it? We need the definitive guide for exiles. It is very short. In fact, it's one verse. It's verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. That's the definitive guide. How do you die to sins and live for righteousness? How do you fight against your sinful desires and do good in the context of suffering? You come back to the cross. You meditate on the cross. You sing of the cross. You pray in thanks for the cross. You fill your heart and your mind and your soul with the cross because it is there where you have been healed. And as you come back to the cross and you're reminded of Christ's love for you, at such a cost, he who committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth, willingly goes to the cross. As you're reminded of that, you will find that your desire for sin will decrease and your desire to be like Christ will grow. That's why it's the definitive guide. You know, Pavlov's house gets its name from Sergeant Yakov Pavlov, who was the overseer of the group of soldiers who defended it. And that platoon came from all over the Soviet Union, from many different nationalities, languages and culture. But they united under Pavlov and their house was never taken by Nazi Germany. They held out for 60 days of constant bombardment. They helped to defend Stalingrad. The fact that the Nazi army couldn't take Stalingrad halted their advance and turned the tide on the Eastern Front. The history books now say that Pavlov's men contributed significantly to the demise of Adolf Hitler's regime. And the house stands today because Pavlov oversaw the safety of that house. You, Christian... Get your name from Christ. And Christ oversees the safety of his house. From earlier in the chapter, as you come to him, the living stone, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so, exile, although your sinful desires wage war against your soul, Although it feels like you're an exposed house in the middle of an open square with bombardment coming from every side and the army feels so strong that you fear that you're going to give in and it's all going to be over. Although that's the way it feels, your soul won't be defeated because you are in Christ's house. And no enemy has the power to defeat your commander. Have a look at verse 25. 
Verse 25 says, For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Christ oversees our souls as he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. It's the definitive guide for exiles. It means that we can withstand suffering and all manner of things that come our way. Because we are in Christ's house. Shall we pray to the shepherd and overseer of our souls? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for Jesus. Because we know the state of our souls. And we know how battered they are by our sin and by the hostility of the world around us. And so, Father, we pray that as we come back to the cross, as we sing of the cross now, would you do work on our souls that we might die to sins and live for righteousness?